Good morning, Lakeview Park, Church of the Nazarene. We are so happy that you are here. Um, <laughs> if you were a guest with us today, would you take one of the communication cards in the seat in front of you, fill that out, and place it in the offering plate when that comes around a little bit later on in the service. That way, Pastor Susie can write you a handwritten note and send it to you in the mail. This is something she's fantastic at, among other things. Um, next Sunday, Pastor does begin a three-week introduction to church membership class at 930. If you're curious about the Church of the Nazarene, uh, about belonging to a faith community, or why membership in a local church, uh, please fill out that communication card, write class or membership on it, a way to get a hold of you, because then you'll be contacted on where the class will be held on campus next week. Pastor Joden, where did Pastor Joden go? Well, he is accepting, ah, back here, yeah, um, he does have a Texas shirt on today, which is fine because they beat Alabama. <laughs> but he will be taking uh, pre-orders for our official Lakeview Park Church of the Nazarene polos. They're steel gray. They're very attractive. They're $30 each, um, and the deadline for your size and your money is Sunday, September 24th. So make sure you connect with Pastor Joden um, within the next couple of weeks. Also that Sunday, September 24th at 5 o'clock, Choctaw Church of the Nazarene is hosting a praise and worship hour for us old folks. It's also known as a zone rally uh, for all the area Nazarene churches. Uh, it's a great opportunity, opportunity to gather together and praise our Lord with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, the address is in your bulletin, so you can put that into your GPS. Okay, now an update on phase two. This is also in your bulletin, but um, our phase two, the ramps on both sides here, and the brand new bathrooms and some work done outside, we have less than $20,000 left. <laughs> to, to uh, fulfill our commitment to pillar contracting. And then we will start in on paying ourselves back the $200,000 uh, in our long-term savings. Once that pays, uh, we get that paid out, that will just kind of help ensure our fiscal stability, our foundation here at the church. Very important. Let's um, continue pray, to pray for Debbie and Danny Lloyd, um, for Jim and Cindy Williams, uh, all the family and friends of Ed Williams who passed away this week. Um, he was such a faithful servant and friend to Lakeview Park. His celebration of life will be Tuesday at Bethany First Church, 2 o'clock, Viewing will be at Mercer Adams in Bethany uh, tomorrow from 6 to 8. Okay, does anyone here know what today is? <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> it's National Grandparents Day. So with all the grandparents in the audience, Stand up so that we can honor you. <laughs> Grandparents are so important. Um, 
just in the prayer support that they give our families. So thank you. Today I'm going to be reading from Proverbs, Proverbs 4, 18 through the end of the chapter. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. My son, my daughter, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's body above all else. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. We praise you for your word is true and it brings abundant life. We praise you as the unchanging God in our ever-changing world. You were faithful and trustworthy yesterday. You are faithful and trustworthy today. And you will be faithful and trustworthy in the days to come. Praise your holy name. Now, Lord, give us eyes to see what you see. Give us ears to hear your word. And give us courage to obey your word. In your precious, life-giving name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.
mood. And it feels so good to see you doing it. That's great on the front row. And in Matthew, Scripture says, wherever you are gathered in my name, I will be there with you. Where two or three are gathered in my name. We've got more than two or three here today, and we know he's here with us. Let's sing, I want to be where you are. I mean, you created the entire world. You are God supreme, yet you are still personal and intimate enough that you save each one of us by your mercy, by your grace. And we thank you for that, almighty God, clothed in majesty. We praise you for that. Jesus, thank you 
that even though you are the exquisite creator of this entire world and every little detail that makes up this world, you are still a very intimate God to each one of us. And that none of us gets lost. None of us slips through the cracks. None of us are forgotten by you. You, you never see us and say, oh, what, what, what was her name? What was his name? You know us inside and out. And oh, Father God, how we thank you for that. Jesus, we thank you for not being a God. We thank you for being the God, the absolute authority, the Lion of Judah, the Supreme One, Jehovah, the one who reigns over all, the one who is always present, and the one who is all-powerful. Thank you for who you are. And Jesus, thank you for not just being a way to heaven. Thank you for being the way to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. We we saturate in that truth this morning. And Father, also today, as we look uh, toward tomorrow, and we can't help but uh, think about 9-11, Jesus, we thank you that you are still on the throne. Even through the tragedies that we've seen and, and witnessed, Lord, you are still on the throne. And Jesus, as we remember 9-11, and those who lost their lives in that horrific tragedy. We thank you, Jesus, that you knew the details of each person. That none of us escapes your notice. And Father, as we move into tomorrow, 9-11, help us to move into it humbly. Help us to move into it knowing that you are still God. That you can be trusted. Help us to place our faith totally, 100% in you and you alone. So, Father, this morning, thank you for the praise and worship that we've just participated in. Jesus, this morning, we come to you humbly. We come to you in genuine faith, and we say, Father, <laughs> there are so many needs in our lives. There are so many things that are not perfect in our lives, but we want to align ourselves with you, the one who is perfect. And thank you for your Holy Spirit, Jesus, who can empower us to become all that you command us to be. In your precious, holy, sacred, all authority name we pray, amen. And amen. Oh, it's good to have you here. If you're a guest, I want to reiterate what Pam said in announcements. If you'll just reach forward and pull out a connection card, put your name and your uh, address on it, and I will send you a personal handwritten card. I do see a few guests from my eye doctor's place. Dr. Mark Privet is my eye doctor. Annette goes to him. How many of the rest of you do you go to Mark? Oh, wow. A lot of you go to him. Well, his whole office staff came this morning. Would you just wave at us? There they are. Make sure you, you go say hi to them after and, and uh, ask them if maybe you need new glasses. Kind of do this when you talk to them. <laughs> and uh, Olivia from SNU, we're glad to have you here this morning. Just wave at us, Olivia. This is your freshman year, right? We're glad to have you here. And there may be some others that I uh, haven't announced, but we're glad that you're here. And I hope you'll pick out a card and put your your information on it. Uh, and I do want to uh, also reiter reiterate that we continue to pray for Debbie and Danny Lloyd's family as uh, we mourn the passing of Ed Williams. As you know, that was your former pastor, Jim Williams' father. We want to remember them in prayer. Ushers, will you come? We want to remind you of giving God what is rightfully his, his tithes, and encourage you to give your offerings. Now, if you're a visitor here, we don't expect you to give anything. We just want you to soak in the service this morning. Father, we ask you that you would continue to help us be good, ser good servants and good stewards of your money. And Father, we ask you that you would help us pay off phase two. Thank you for enabling us to get phase two built 
the new bathrooms, the new ramps, Lord, thank you so much. What a gift that you have given us to help a church our size undertake and almost complete paying off this huge blessing that you've allowed us to have. But Father, we, we know that we're not done yet. And so we ask that you would continue to guide us in our giving. Oh, how we love you, Father. And we thank you for meeting every one of our needs. Jesus, for those here who maybe have never tithed in their lives, maybe they've never trusted you enough to give you the 10% that you've asked in the Bible that we give you from all of our income, Lord, would you bring them to deeper faith this morning and show them how much you want to bless them by simply being obedient to you. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Thank you for you. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, if you feel comfortable as the ushers come, would you just mind taking about two or three rows forward if you feel comfortable doing that? Uh, it would sure help me looking out and seeing some uh, faces right here at the front. So if you feel comfortable, you get up and move. <laughs>
saint and a seer. Because he was a saint, his book is extremely practical. And we take a quick look at his life and the lives of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see commitment, conviction, and courage in standing up against the world system and standing before the Lord. But because Daniel was also a seer, his Old Testament book is very prophetic. In fact, many scholars say it's the most prophetic book in the entire Bible. Because the book of Daniel is the key that unlocks the book of Revelation. We won't delve inside the prophecy portion in this little three-week study, but we will take a close look at his life. Then we'll take another three weeks to glimpse at the lives of his three best friends. So allow me to introduce you to Daniel. Well, good morning. And as you can tell, we are starting a new series. Uh, James hung up my lion for me. Um, I came in the sanctuary saying, there's Judah, as in the lion of the tribe of. And James says, no, I named him Filbert. So <laughs> you choose your own name for our lion, but we are starting a new series, and I hope you brought your Bibles with you. If you brought your Bibles, just wave them at me. Oh, those are the swords. You've got the sword of the Spirit when you have the Bible with you, and you bring these to follow along, but you also bring these to make sure that I'm telling you the truth to make sure I'm not pulling the wool over your eyes. So it's good to have your Bibles. Well, as we dive inside the Old Testament book of Daniel, we see in the very first chapter that evil King Nebuchadnezzar has attacked the godly city of Jerusalem. And he ordered some of the most handsome, physically fit, and intelligent teen guys to be captured and brought to the city of Babylon. Now these were teenagers. These were teen guys. Teenage young men who may have looked like this. I, I don't know. They, they just may have looked kind of like that. Now these were guys with integrity. They were guys with character who loved God. And even though they'd been taken captive and they'd been thrown into a foreign culture, they had to learn a completely new language. Their commitment to God never wavered. Oh, if we could be like those teen guys. Our commitment to God never wavering. So let's just push the fast forward button, okay? Let's push the fast forward button from chapter 1 and go all the way to chapter 6. By the way, I need to tell you, confession... I forgot to wear my watch this morning, so who knows how long this may go. I'm surprised about 30 of you didn't rush up here and hand me your watches like that. No, thank goodness we do have a little clock back there, so, but I'm used to looking here instead of there. So we'll just see how long or short this goes. <laughs> so let's push the fast forward button from chapter 1 to chapter 6 in the book of Daniel, okay? Um, the king on the throne now, by the time we get to chapter 6 is a guy named King Darius. Now, we don't have a photo of Darius, but we do have some pretty talented artists in our children's department. Here's what was created. That's pretty close to what he looked like, I think. And as Daniel chapter 6 opens, Daniel is once again about to be promoted to a high office. Now, evidently, King Darius on the throne has recognized Daniel as a man of integrity. And he wanted to make him second in command over the entire kingdom. This is where the intrigue begins. The administrators and satraps were jealous. Satraps were kind of like mayors, governing officials of smaller sections of the country. And they were jealous. They wanted those prominent positions for which Daniel was going to be promoted. And so they tried to find grounds for charges against him in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in Daniel because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never 
find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. And this is where his enemies discovered. This is what his enemies discovered when they examined his life. They discovered that Daniel was faithful in his duties. He was faultless in his character. He was fervent in his prayers. And these are three marks of godliness that even unbelievers could see in his life. I want you to know the people who watch you can tell if you work hard at your job. They can tell what kind of character you have or don't have. They know what, what you're made of. And if they watch long enough, they will see. They'll find out. They'll discover if you're a person of prayer or not. Whatever is in your heart will come out sooner or later. And people who don't even know the Lord will know the truth about you. There's an old song that Mike Price sang for us about a year and a half ago. I guess it all comes down to where your heart is. It's there your thoughts and feelings all begin. And if you never give your heart to Jesus, you never really have a place with Him. It all comes down to where your heart is. So I need to ask you, where's your heart this morning? Because whatever is in your heart is eventually going to come out. In Daniel's case, even his enemies had to admit he had no glaring weaknesses. No finer thing could be said than for your enemies to admit they can't find anything wrong with you. Daniel was hated. Why? Because he was successful and he was godly. Now, let's just suppose your enemies decided to check you out the way the satraps came after Daniel. Suppose someone hired some private investigators to search every aspect of your life, public and private, past and present. What, what would they uncover? What would they see? Let's just say, suppose they checked out your high school and college records. How you treat your children, your phone calls, your shopping habits, what you spend your money on. How you treat your parents and your brothers and sisters, your internet usage, your financial records, your favorite TV shows, what you do on vacation when no one else is around. The movies you watch, every relationship you have ever had, your tax returns, every corner of your bedroom, business deals, police record, how you act on the job, how you deal with the opposite sex, your vocabulary at home, the jokes you tell, how you treat your spouse, the places you visit. Could any of us survive that kind of scrutiny? Well, Daniel did. The investigation revealed that he had no obvious moral weaknesses. And try as they might, his enemies found nothing wrong with his life. He lived so consciously in God's presence that he was a man above reproach. But Daniel did have one flaw. Flaw. He was utterly predictable in his daily prayers. He prayed every day at the same time, in the same way, so that his enemies realized this was where they could catch him. Maybe you've heard this phrase before. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a haunting question. Think about that. Would there be enough evidence 
to convict you? Do those at your workplace, those in your neighborhood, those at your school, do they know beyond doubt you have committed your life to Christ and are actively serving him? When they arrested Daniel for being a man of prayer, the evidence against him was overwhelming. Of course he prays. We've seen him. So the satraps asked Daniel, I'm sorry, asked Darius, the satraps, the little mayors, asked King Darius to pass a 30-day law forbidding anyone to pray except to King Darius himself. In other words, in effect, they were saying, Oh, King Darius, how would you like to be God for a month? Well, sure, why not? That appealed to his pride. Why not be God for a month? That might be kind of fun. So Darius signed the law knowing it could not be repealed, not even by himself. And meanwhile, the satraps are snickering. <laughs> they knew Daniel would break the law. That is, they knew Daniel would keep on praying just as he had always done. <laughs> you see, Daniel was a victim of his own integrity. He was predictably faithful to God. Oh, let's pray that that would be true of us. That we would become predictably faithful to God. If he had been a flaky believer or a casual or lukewarm Christian like we mentioned last Sunday, this evil plot would have never worked. If, you see, his troubles didn't come from his weaknesses. His troubles came from his strength. Satan had surely influenced those people, those satraps. And they used one of Satan's oldest devices, flattery. You see, you are never more like the devil than when you tell a lie. And many of Satan's favorite weapons are envy, jealousy, discontentment, and lies. And again, you're never more like Satan than when you tell a lie. After all, isn't this where sin began? In the Garden of Eden. First it started with a question, did God really say that? That you can't eat from this one tree? Yes, he did, Eve responded, because if we do, we will surely die. You know, mankind wasn't created to die. Mankind was created to live forever. But yet when sin entered the picture, then physical death began to take its toll. Now we can live, etern uh, we can live forever eternally with Jesus. But man wasn't created to live and die. And so when, the, when Satan then lies to Eve, no, that's not what's true, Eve. God said you would die. You're not going to die. You're going to become as wise as God is. That's a lie. That's where it all started, back in the Garden of Eden. And you are never more like Satan than when you choose to lie. Now we see another one of Satan's devices, flattery. They were making King Darius out to be a god. Flattery is the art of telling a person what he thinks of himself. Dishonesty, flattery, and then pride set in. Darius would take the bait. Now they must have had all the paperwork at hand. Darius was faced with a hasty decision. Christians, let me plead with you, don't. Make hasty decisions. Take time to pray and to seek the Lord's advice. My dad, Elmer Schellenberger, uh, taught business at SNU for several decades. And in his, one of his business management classes, um, he told me that he would teach his students after uh, a great um, tragedy in your life. Let's say there's a... Uh, your spouse dies or a child dies. He said, please, always wait one solid year before you make any decisions. 
Well, I'm going to move. I just can't stand it any longer. Everything in my house reminds me of my child, my spouse, my... No, no please, please wait a year. Don't make any hasty decisions. Well, I'm, I'm going to move to a different state. I need to get... No, just, just please, just wait a year. Well, so people are calling, and I need to take out this insurance, or I need to do with this policy. No, just, just please, just wait a year. Just wait a year and pray and get more stability. Oh, that's good advice. And so, Christians, this morning, I encourage you, don't make hasty decisions. Wait and pray through and seek God's advice. Daniel could have said, well, I'll still pray, but I'll just pray in secret so no one will actually see me. I'll pull down the window shades. I don't really need to pray in front of an open window facing Jerusalem. He could have said that. No, Daniel would not consider an easy way out. God would come first. What a man of prayer Daniel was. Oh, maybe may we be this way. Daniel had a place in his house where he prayed. A, a specific little war room area right there underneath that, underneath that open window. And how sad that many of God's people could go for a month. It was just a 30-day law. How sad that many of God's people could go a month without prayer. And not even realize, wait a minute, something big is missing in my life. Daniel would go to the lion's den first before he went without prayer. And the king, King Darius, would now realize he'd been fooled. Oh, if he had just taken more time to, to think this through before making this foolish decision. Satan doesn't fight fair. Hurry up, hurry up. You have to decide. Hurry up. Do it now. Author Max Lucado describes Satan's tactics really well, and I want to share this with you. Satan is the master of the trap door and the author of weak moments. He waits until your back is turned. He waits until your defenses are down. He waits until the bell is rung and you are walking back to your corner. Then he aims his arrow at your weakest point and bullseye, you lose your temper, you lust. You fall, you take a drag, you follow the crowd, you rationalize, you say yes, you sign your name, you forget who you are, you walk into her room, you look in the window, you buy the magazine, you lie, you covet, you stomp your feet and demand your own way, you deny your master. It's David disrobing Bathsheba. It's Adam accepting the fruit from Eve. It's Abraham lying about his wife, Sarah. It's Peter denying that he ever knew Jesus. It's Noah drunk and naked in his tent with his daughter. It's Lot in bed with his own daughter. It's your worst nightmare. It's sudden. It is sin. Now let's go back to the story of Daniel and those lions. Because if we look at that story, we can see three ways to defeat the enemy. Three ways to keep him from wrecking our lives. There are three things that Daniel did that will bless our lives if we do them. The first thing that we see Daniel do is choose character over comfort. There were no skeletons in Daniel's closet waiting to haunt him. He wasn't doing anything behind closed doors that he was ashamed of. Even Daniel's biggest enemy, Satan, couldn't find anything. Now let's make this practical. Let's just unpack this. Let's read about Satan, our enemy. Be careful. Watch out. Those are action verbs. Watch out for attacks from Satan, your great enemy. He prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion looking for some victim to tear apart. When Satan prowls around like a roaring lion looking for a nice, juicy Christian to devour, what's he really looking for? 
Well, he's looking for someone who's an easy target. He, he's looking for people who have areas in their lives that open them up to Satan's attack. He's looking for someone who has areas of disobedience that give Satan a foothold. That's exactly what Daniel's enemies were looking for. And that's what your enemy is looking for. For when you're angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil, Ephesians 4.27. The next thing we see Daniel do, number two, is to choose discipline over disorder. You see, Daniel made a choice to live with such a high standard of integrity that there was no foothold for Satan, no weak area for him to attack. It was impossible for any of Daniel's enemies to find an area to even accuse him. Let me ask you, are you giving Satan a foothold in your life that he can exploit? Some of us look at our lives and we say, eh, I'm doing pretty good. There are no major areas of sin in my life. I, I'm not stealing money, not stealing from anybody. I mean, I, I'm not having an affair with someone. I, I'm not doing anything big and bad. I, I, I'm doing okay. But we have little areas of our life that we know are wrong. And we know they don't please God. But we ignore them because they're not very noticeable. And, and I don't need to give you examples. You know exactly what those areas are in your life. The little areas that don't please God, but you just let them go on and on. And try to overlook them because they seem fairly small. Do you know what those are? Those are footholds. Those are places where your enemy can start to work and begin to bring trouble into your life. Satan uses those little areas to create big areas to try to separate you from God. To destroy your relationships and your integrity and your peace and your joy in life. They're footholds. Now, you've no doubt heard the term foothold. Well, what exactly is a foothold? It's a planned move to establish a position. It can be a military term. For example, we have gained a foothold across our enemy lines. Or if you heard, this will give China's vessels a strategic foothold in the Pacific. Well, it would mean that China would have planned access into the Pacific Ocean. Spiritually speaking, our enemy, the devil, can gain a foothold in the life of a Christian. That is, when a Christian lets down his guard. Just as someone in a military battle might do, the enemy... Satan advances, he takes advantage, and he gains access. Maybe you realize you have a foothold in your life, and you're thinking about it right now. Well, the wrong response is to start feeling guilty and condemned and depressed. That's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to feel really bad about yourself, but never do anything to change. That's the wrong response. Don't get down on yourself. Instead, get down on your knees and admit it to God and ask him for help. Dear God, I've been wrong. Will you forgive me? There's a foothold in my life. And tell God, I am not going to let the devil have a foothold in my life. I'm tired of him trying to destroy the good things in my life. I am not 
going to let him keep that up the rest of my life. This is going to stop. With your help and your strength, God, I know I can overcome the enemy with your Holy Spirit within me, empowering me, and I am not going to settle for second best any longer. Woo! That's a hanky-waving moment. I am not going to give the devil a foothold in my life. Well, Daniel made that decision, and you can too. The third choice Daniel made was to choose love over life. Is your love for Christ more important than your ambitions, than your goals, than your dreams? Is it more important than the acceptance of your peers? Is it more important than your pursuit of power or possession? Is it more important, your relationship with God, is it more important, your love for God, than anything else, even your very life? Years ago, we used to sing a little song that went like this. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Remember that? Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. Nothing I desire compares with you. Maybe you sung that song. Do you really mean it? Do you really desire God more than anything else in your life? I've been watching the U.S. Open, and yesterday afternoon was the women's finals. I don't know if anybody else of you have watched this, but Coco Goff is the youngest person to win this Grand Slam U.S. Open tournament beside, at this young age besides Serena when Serena won it at 17. Coco's just 19. And I did some research on Coco. She professes uh, Christianity, places her faith in Jesus, and her church back home has been praying for her. And if you happen to catch that match, then you probably saw at the end of the match, after she fell on the court in tears, she picked herself up. She ran into the stands to hug her dad and her mom, and then she ran right back down on the court. She fell to her knees. She put her hands in a praying position. You could watch her lips move. She was thanking God. Later, uh, the commentators were interviewing her, and they asked her, they said, your faith must play an important part of your life, right? And she said, oh, yes, it does. We saw you praying there on the court side, and she said, yes. She said, I never, I never pray for the result of a match. In other words, she's not praying, God, help me win this match. God, make my, my opponent lose. She's not praying for the result of a match. She says, I pray to do my best, to be at my very best. I love that. Here's a woman in front of all the world who was watching, knelt and prayed and thanked God for the win, knowing that she wasn't strong enough to do it on her own. I hope you and I can be men and women of prayer. Maybe you've sung that little song. I'm just asking, do we really mean it, Lord? You really are more precious than silver. You really are more precious than gold, more, more than the money in my bank account, more than knowing how I'm going to pay my next bill. Lord, you really are more important than my family. I mean, I, th I thank you for them. I love them. You gave them to me. But you're of utmost importance. Do you really desire God more than anything else in your life? That's the kind of man Daniel was. That's the kind of disciple that God is calling you to be. And if you did really desire God more than anything else in your life, would it change any of your priorities? Would it change the way you spend your time would it change the way you spend your money? Would you consider tithing? Lord, you've commanded 10% of our income goes to you. Then would you be obedient in that? Would it change the way you spend your energy or what you commit yourself to? What is it costing you 
to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me ask that again. What's it costing you to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Is your faith based on convenience? Well, sure, Pastor Susie. I'm committed as long as it's convenient. You see, the great part about being a follower of God, a disciple of Christ, is that when we make up the decision to give up everything and follow Him, He gives us back more than we ever had in the first place. More love, more joy, more peace, more of His Spirit guiding and directing us, more purpose for our lives more fulfillment as we see God working in us and through us. I think that's why it probably says in Malachi, the last little book of the Old Testament, I think it's chapter 3, verse 10, test me on this. God's talking about tithing. Test me on this and see that I will open wide the windows of heaven and bring blessing upon you if you'll test me, if you'll take my word on this. You see, that's a strange thing about being a believer. God asks us to give him everything we have, and then he blesses us so much that we've never had it so good. And I'm not talking about getting a new BMW. Well, I'll tithe next week, and I'm going to expect a BMW in my driveway. No, I'm not talking necessarily material things, though he may choose to bless you materially. I'm talking about blessings beyond what you can comprehend. We'll see at the end of the story that Daniel was blessed beyond what he could ever imagine. So Daniel chooses to give up his life so he can stay faithful to God. And God not only shuts the mouths of the lions and protects his life, but God blesses Daniel incredibly. Instead of having to hide his prayer to God in verse 26, King Darius issues a proclamation that says everybody in the whole kingdom must now worship the God of Daniel. And then in verse 28 it says, So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. God protects Daniel from Satan and he blesses him beyond what he ever imagined. Why? Because Daniel chose character over comfort because Daniel chose discipline over disorder and he chose love over life God rescued God blessed Daniel and God does the same for people today that's us let's go to scripture Colossians 1 13 for he has rescued us out of darkness and gloom of Satan's kingdom and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son who bought our freedom with his blood and forgave us some of our sins. Well, most of our sins. All of our sins. When we put our trust in God, we're delivered from any power the devil ever had over us. The only hold Satan has on you is what you give him. Oh, we need to repeat that. And I want to ask you to read it with me, will you? Here we go. The only hold Satan has on you is what you give him. If you don't give him anything, he's already lost. And when we live a life that's filled with God's Spirit, and when we begin living in holiness according to the power that His Spirit gives us within us, we call that sanctification. And we live in peace and humility by forgiving others and by asking forgiveness when we're wrong. Satan can't find a foothold. And he's going to lose every time he tries to attack you. Let's close with one last verse. Romans 16, 19 and 20. Stay alert. Again, those are action verbs. And before you know it, the God of peace will come down on Satan with both feet, stomping him into the dirt. Enjoy the best of Jesus. Hey, that's the real key. We want to enjoy the best of Jesus and the real life he has to offer. Not just eternal life, but life here on earth. A great life here and now. How do you get that life if you don't have it? You don't get it through religion. You get it through a personal relationship 
with Jesus Christ. And some of you this morning may not be sure that you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus. I'm not talking about a religion where you show up at church and you obey the rules and you try to do your best. That won't do it. You need a personal relationship with God. You need to know Him personally by inviting Him into your life and making Him the manager and owner of your life. Many of you have a relationship with God right now, but you'd love to go deeper. And I sincerely hope that all of us want to go deeper. So our, our, our altar this morning is open. I hope your prayer would be, oh dear Jesus, draw me close to you. The book of James says, if you draw nigh or you draw near to Christ, he will draw nigh or he will draw near to you. This morning, that's what we want to do. We just, Jesus, we just want to be where you are. As we sang this morning, I just want to be where you are. I just want to dwell in your presence. I want to draw near to you. I want intimacy with you. No longer any footholds. I want you to be Lord of my life. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would like to come and pray, this altar is open, and you can come and just kneel at this altar. And if it's too hard for you to kneel, you can just come and sit on the front row in the middle. But if you want to go deeper with Jesus this morning, if you want to go deeper than you've ever been before, if you want to say, hey, 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 no more footholds in my life, then this morning there's a spot for you right up here. Let's sing together as the worship team leads us. And you obey God and come to Him in an attitude of prayer.
friend, we're reminded in the book of Acts that Saul, right after his conversion, he went and met with the disciples and uh, after that, after I'm pushing the fast forward button, began preaching and the people who heard him preaching said, whoa, 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 isn't that the guy who persecuted Christians, who captured them and threw them in prison, whoa, 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 yes, that was who I used to be. But not anymore. Because when I come to Christ, I am a new creation in Him. I don't know what you used to be. I don't, I don't know if, if you're dealing with pornography or alcohol or drugs or gossip or criticism. I don't know. But could that be what you used to be? And today would be the day that you say to Satan, no more. I want to say that's in my past, and today I am a brand new creation in Jesus Christ. I, I just don't feel clear in dismissing quite yet. I'm not going to hold you much longer. But Dana, could we sing that? Uh, could we sing just a portion of that over again? And then I'll dismiss in a moment. I just want you to know there's room for you right up here. This could be your day. No more footholds. Draw me close.
Father, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, that you want us near to you. Thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you that you reach down to us. We don't have to figure out a way to, to get into you, that you reach down to us because you love us so much. Jesus, now, would, would you be with us through the rest of the week? Would you bring to our minds as we go through the week anything in our lives that could be a foothold? And when you bring that to our mind, help us to immediately turn that over to you because we want all of you. And we want you to have all of us. Oh, we love you, Father. In your precious, holy, sacred name, we pray. Amen. There will be no young adult classes that meet tonight for one Sunday. No adult classes. May God shine his face upon you. May he bless you. And may you live in his love for you this week. You are 